With an area of 132,000 square kilometers for 11 million inhabitants, Greece is made up of three geographic regions. To the north, continental Greece with the cities of Athens and Delphi. To the south, separated by the Gulf of Corinth, the Peloponnese Peninsula with the cities Epidaurus and Mycenae. And of course, the islands that make up one-fifth of the total surface area of the country. After the civilizations of the Cyclades and Crete concentrated on the islands, the Mycenaean civilization flourished on the continent from the 16th to the 12th centuries BC. Then invasions resulted in the destruction of the civilization and marked the beginning of the ancient Greek period, the classical or golden age of which was between the 6th and 3rd century BC, with Athens as its leading city. Today, Athens is the capital and largest city of the country with 750,000 inhabitants and over 3 million including its surroundings. But Athens is also one of the most ancient cities in the world, founded around the year 800 BC with the fusion of several villages around the protected site of the Acropolis. The Acropolis is a rocky plateau around 148 meters high, the flat top of which measures 300 meters east to west and 85 meters north to south. It is only accessible via steep slope on the western side. Traces of occupation dating to the Bronze Age have been discovered. Then, in the 13th century BC, it was used for a fortress where the king lived which was surrounded by powerful Cyclopean walls. After the fall of the Mycenaean civilization during the Archaic period of antiquity, all the old fortifications, buildings and statues were destroyed during the Persian occupation of Athens. Then, entirely rebuilt in the classical era of the 5th century BC, the Acropolis was no longer a fortress and became a sanctuary sheltering several monuments and temples. Now listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, it is one of the most visited touristic sites in the world. Standing majestically on the Acropolis, the Parthenon is the symbol of ancient Greece. The 70-meter-long by 31-meter-wide building was made entirely from marble. And since antiquity, it has been considered a perfect representation of Doric architecture. The 46 columns, over 10 meters high, have smooth capitals, and the layout follows a rigorous sense of proportions. While today, the work of the hundreds of sculptors is bleached white by the sun, the sculptors were originally painted various colors and decorated with gilded bronze in places. On the pediments, and on the entablatures resting on the colonnade, the episodes portrayed deal as much with myth as with history and politics. And the history of Athena, the daughter of Zeus, was naturally in the spotlight. She was the patron goddess of the city and the Parthenon was her home. In this sense, the building was more than a temple. It was a treasury that stood as a place of tribute to her. The Erechtheion was the real temple where the goddess was worshipped. Constructed shortly after the Parthenon, it replaced an ancient temple which held a sacred statue made of olive wood. The religious ceremonies themselves were held on an outdoor altar. Later on then, the Baroque succeeded classicism here, and simplicity gave way to refinement. It is the triumph of the Ionic style. Attached to the temple on the southern side, there is the famous porch of the Caryatids, where six statues of draped young women serve as columns supporting the entablature. The creation of this porch was a revolution at the time due to the use of the women, even if the clear folds of their peploi evoke the grooves of a column. With a rare postural elegance, each supports a capital that has the appearance of a basket. The braids and curls of their hairstyles are all different and frame very noble faces. It was the last monument erected on the Acropolis before the end of the 5th century BC and is renowned for its elegant and unusual architecture. We leave the Acropolis from the same pathway on which we arrived. 
the sacred path that traverses the entire site and passes through the Propyleia, which are the monuments that make up the entrance to the sacred hill. On the slope of the Acropolis, there is the most important theater of ancient Greece, the Theater of Dionysus, the god of wine. The major celebrations of Dionysia were held there each year in his honor. They initially consisted of songs, dances, and ritual sacrifices, taking the form of theatrical performances. Its construction goes back to the 5th century BC, and in the beginning, it consisted of only a hemispherical orchestra with a dirt floor in front of a wooden stage, and the spectator sat on the natural slope of the site. The stone structure that we can admire today was built 100 years later. The first row of seats consisted of 67 marble thrones, reserved for various dignitaries, magistrates, important people, and judges of the competition. Then, going up, the theater had 78 rows of seats and could hold 17,000 spectators. The great Dionysia took place before the statue of the god and were presided over by a great priest in the spring of each year. The famous classical tragedies of Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides were created for this occasion, which made this structure the cradle of the ancient Greek drama and tragedy that is still taught today in schools around the world. At the foot of the sacred hill, a new museum was created in 2009 to shelter objects from the monuments and excavations on the Acropolis. Built on stilts, the museum preserves and incorporates an archaeological site unearthed during its construction. The distribution of the pillars was dictated by the location of the vestiges. With a surface area of 25,000 square meters, 10 times larger than the old museum, it can also exhibit numerous objects that were previously held in storage. Notably, it holds the originals of the Caryatids, which were replaced with copies on site. The goal is to protect all these masterpieces that deteriorate in the open air due to chemical reactions with the pollution of the city, which eats away at the stone. Four of the Caryatids are originals. The fifth is a copy. And as for the sixth, it is held in the British Museum in London. There is also the great frieze from the Parthenon, which shows the major procession given by the city in honor of the goddess Athena, which took place every four years. On this day, a procession made its way towards the Temple of Athena, the Erechtheion, in order to leave offerings at the foot of the statue of the goddess. The frieze, which portrays this event, was made of 115 blocks and had a total length of 160 meters, completely encircling the Parthenon. 50 meters of what remains of the frieze are here in the Acropolis Museum. 80 meters are in the British Museum in London, one block is in the Louvre Museum in Paris, and other fragments are dispersed throughout various European museums. But in Athens, the vestiges of ancient Greece do not stop at the Acropolis. Spread throughout the city, the remains of this golden age appear suddenly amidst the modernity, like clues to decode to uncover its history. At the foot of the Acropolis, the Agora was the meeting place and market of the city. It was also where there were government buildings and democratic institutions, as well as various religious edifices and courts. Among the vestiges, a statue of Hadrian shows the overlapping of the Greek world and the Roman Empire between the 2nd century BC and the 5th century AD. On the armor of the emperor, Athena, the patron goddess of Athens, stands above a wolf, the symbol of Rome. 
This not only means that Rome supported Greece, but also that Greek culture dominated Rome. This is a reminder that Rome, after having conquered and brutalized the Greeks, had been fascinated by Hellenistic culture, starting with the reigns of Julius Caesar, Augustus, and Hadrian, who considerably enlarged the city. But back to the golden age of ancient Greece. On the Agora, there's the Temple of Hephaestus, the god of fire and brother of Athena. Like the Parthenon, this temple dates from the 5th century BC. It is the best conserved ancient monument in Athens. Here too, the Doric columns are slightly bulged to give the temple a slender silhouette for those who look towards the top. Opened in 415, it is made entirely of marble and its proportions also conform to the golden ratio. The friezes evoke the combat and victory of Theseus, the mythical founder of Athens over the centaurs, creatures that were half man, half horse. All around the temple, sacred plants like pomegranate, myrtle, and bay trees were planted to add to its harmony. In the eastern part of the Agora, the Stoa of Attalos is a portico that contained around 40 shops in ancient times. It was a shopping center that was rebuilt identically in the 1950s and now holds the museum of the ancient Agora. Among its treasures, there's a beautiful statue of Aphrodite, the goddess of love, beauty, and sexuality, with a magnificent drape effect. and two statues, one of which represents the Odyssey, Homer's literary masterpiece from the 7th century BC, which recounts the adventures of Ulysses, and the other, the Iliad, which evokes the Trojan War with heroes like Achilles. These two statues represent the two founding poems of all European culture. Adjacent to the old quarter, the agora called the Roman Agora was begun by the Emperor Augustus at the end of the pre-Christian era. This agora was meant to complement the first, which was by then very crowded. It was a large 111 by 98 meters square, surrounded by four columned porticos. The Tower of the Wind stands on the eastern side. This octagonal tower was a monumental hydraulic clock that worked on the principle of a regular flow of water over time. It is remarkable for the high relief figures of the gods of the wind that decorate each of its eight sides. Furthermore, each of the sides of the monument is exposed to the sun at a precise time of day. The large, central rectangular space was surrounded by shops and contained public latrines. The western entrance has retained its monumental gate marked by its Doric columns topped by a pediment. It was the Gate of Athena. Overlooking the Agoras, the Panix Hill was the seat of the assembly of citizens who voted on laws and budgets, or the selection of judges, by raising their hands. The site was more calm than the Agora and conducive to the various debates. A little further away, there is the Olympion, the Temple of Zeus. Its construction, which began in the 6th century BC, was finished by Hadrian in the year 131. Its sponsors wanted to make it the largest temple in the world. But of this 108-meter-long temple that had 104 17-meter-high columns, only 15 columns remain today, supporting a few architraves. The capitals are Corinthian, sculpted and plant-like. Hadrian dedicated the temple to Zeus, the supreme god of Greek mythology. He was the god of the air, the blue sky, and the weather. He is the protector of the laws of the world and gradually became the god of gods.
Cape Sunio is especially famous for the ruins of a temple devoted to Poseidon. The first mention of the cape in the ancient texts occurs in the Odyssey, which mentions Cape Sunio as the sacred cape of Athens. The ruins of the Temple of Poseidon, built in the mid-5th century BC, overlook the sea from a height of 60 meters. The pillars of the temple rise 6.10 meters high, with a base diameter of 1 meter. Their splines were designed to resist the effects of saline air. Homer called the Temple of Poseidon the sacred promontory. And here, navigators called upon the god of the sea. According to legend, Cape Sunio is the place where Aegeus, father of Theseus, leapt to his death by jumping off of the cliff because he believed that his son had perished in a battle against the Minotaur. Thus the name of the Aegean Sea, the famous sea that surrounds Greece. But Greece is not confined to Athens, its capital. Since the beginning of its history, the cities held sway and fought wars to establish their superiority over each other. In the 8th century BC, in the mountains north of the Gulf of Corinth, Delphi was one of the great sanctuaries of ancient Greece dedicated to the god Apollo. On the slopes of Mount Parnassus, the ancient Greeks from all the cities came to consult the Pythia, who was the priestess who delivered the oracles, meant to be the god Apollo's responses to the questions that were brought to him. The sanctuary contains a large number of structures, including the tholos, which is a circular-shaped edifice with a funerary or religious purpose. It is a rare and atypical structure due to its distinctive architecture. Originally, 20 Doric columns supported the entablature and the roof decorated with tiles. The tholos is considered the most beautiful monument at Delphi, but it is also the most mysterious. Its origin and its purpose are still unknown. The sanctuary at Delphi was active throughout the classical period of ancient Greece, and even during the Roman era for more than a thousand years. On the sacred way, a Roman agora was even built in the 4th century AD. Equipped with a portico containing shops, this construction was part of a larger ensemble that also contained thermal baths and houses. Today, the columns of the portico have been erected again, and behind them you can see the spaces that held the shops. The use of bricks is typical of Roman buildings. On an image of the Temple of Apollo as it was at the time, you can see the small Athenian portico, which stands against the supporting wall at its feet. Erected in 480 BC, this portico was a building consisting of eight Ionic columns, only three of which can still be seen today. It contained trophies taken from the Persians after naval victories. On the site, the structures are called treasuries. During the consultation of the oracles, offerings were brought to Apollo, and they were stored in these buildings depending on their richness. Here, the Sicyonian treasury contains statues and votive elements, much like the site that had several thousand of them according to testimonies from the era. Here's a navel of the world. It was the symbol of the unity of the Greek world. And here, the Boeotian treasury. Former rivals of the Athenians, they became their most valued allies in the war against the Spartans in the 4th century BC. For the Athenians, the Boeotians had a reputation for being uncultivated, dim-witted, and unsophisticated. Even now, the adjective Boeotian means an uncultured person. Sanctuaries were architectural complexes outside of the cities and their politics, which means that they were frequented not only by the ancient Greeks, but also by the nearby, sometimes barbarian people who worshipped the same gods. The site is traversed by a sacred path that was used for processions and led to all the sites of worship dispersed across the side of the mountain up to the sanctuary.
it passes in front of the Athenian treasury, built around 480 BC to commemorate the victory against the Persians at Marathon. Amongst the numerous, more or less well-preserved vestiges of the site, the theater, with a 5,000-person capacity, was built in the 4th century BC. The role of the theaters at the time of their construction was closely tied to religion. In the Greek world, theatrical performance was born from the celebration of Dionysus. Dionysus was the god of wine and the inebriation that made it possible to pass from the imagination to reality, just like the illusion of theater gives life to the imagination of the author on stage. The theater was thus a vector of mysticism in ancient Greece. Just below the theater, the temple of the master of the site, Apollo. At the end of it, there's an altar where sacrifices were carried out. Usually, they were goats whose throats were slit. The animals were first washed with water, and if they shivered during this rite, they were fit for the ceremony. The temple itself is rectangular, with an elongated form measuring 23 by 60 meters. It had six Doric columns on its facade and 15 on each side. After the sacrifice, the great priests arrived and the oracle was questioned. If there should be a war or not, if someone should get married, if it would be dangerous to do such and such a thing, etc. The pilgrims were separated from the Pythia by a curtain when she was in a trance. She then uttered words that were incomprehensible to the common man but not to the priests who translated the responses to the questions asked, in verse until the 3rd century BC and in prose afterwards. In the temple, a sacred fire was maintained and always kept burning. The stadium, built in the 5th century BC, was also remodeled by the Romans in the 2nd century AD. The sporting events, for which the participants were completely nude, began with horse races, harnessed or not. Then the pentathlon unfolded, which included five disciplines, the discus throw, the javelin throw, the long jump, running, and wrestling. And there was only one winner who was awarded. At Delphi, the archaeological museum compensates for the things missing from the site. First of all, it displays a model that shows the sanctuary as it was during antiquity. It shows the place occupied by the temple facing the theater or the treasuries. The board showing the Siphnian treasury clearly shows all the attention that was paid to the architecture and decoration of the various monuments. The pediment was rediscovered during excavations in 1893. The frieze that runs around the entire edifice shows the Olympians deciding the fate of Troy, seated and talking, while before them the Greeks and their enemies battle furiously. The treasury made of brilliant marble was preceded by an entrance with two columns that supported the architrave. These columns were in the form of caryatids, the young girls richly dressed in robes and Ionian jewelry. Another wonder of the museum, the statues said to be of Cleobis and Biton, called the twins of Argos, which were created around 600 BC. With their stocky and muscular stature, the twins could have been wrestlers. Legend has it that their mother, very proud of her sons, asked the goddess Hera to give them the best. The two brothers then went to sleep and never woke up. In this, the goddess showed that it was better for them to die than to live, possibly sparing them from suffering, although nobody knew. In one of the rooms, you can see fragments from the pediments of the Temple of Apollo. Dionysus is shown on one of them. 
In Greek mythology, Dionysus is the god of the vine, of wine and its excesses, of madness and immoderation, as well as theater and tragedy. He's the son of Zeus, but does not live on Mount Olympus. He's a wandering god. Of the other pediment, there only remains a piece of a lion devouring an antelope, and a fragment of a young girl. Another statue shows Aegeus, a wrestling champion, who was inadvertently killed by Telemachus during bare-fisted combat. His brother Agelaus was also a wrestler, but less talented. With the two previous statues, this third one was part of a group of seven given to the sanctuary of Apollo by a rich family. In the room, there's a Roman copy of the Omphalos, the stone navel of Delphi. The original marked the point where, according to legend, the eagles released by Zeus at the two ends of the earth crossed paths, defining the center of the world. Through the remains of the statues and finely chiseled columns, you can appreciate the degree of skill and expertise of the sculptors who worked at Delphi 2,500 years ago, certainly the best of ancient Greece. As proof, this 13-meter-high tripod with three dancers, which held a bronze cauldron for the offerings. Like a giant perfume diffuser. These are the priestesses of Dionysus. To the left, the marble altar of the Temple of Athena shows sculptures in relief. just like the magnificent friezes found in the ruins of the theater. Another vestige of the Roman era, this marble statue portrays Antinous. This lover of the Emperor Hadrian died at 20 years old, drowned in the Nile, in circumstances that remain mysterious. Today, he's one of the most famous faces of antiquity, Another famous portrait, that of Flamininus, a Roman general who saved Greece from the Macedonian invaders in the second century BC. He was one of the first Romans to appreciate and spread Greek culture in his own country. But the most famous piece in the museum is certainly the charioteer of Delphi. This bronze statue, the size of a man, was commissioned by a Greek prince to commemorate the victory of his chariot in the Olympic Games of 478 BC. The statue is of the chariot driver. The Acro Corinth is a natural fortress overlooking the Isthmus of Corinth and the eponymous city. The site was occupied from the 6th century BC to the 19th century. It contains numerous remains of its past occupiers, Corinthians, Romans, Byzantines, Franks, Venetians, and Ottomans. The site was already occupied during the Neolithic period due to its many streams. The oldest remains date back to the 1000 BC, while the first identifiable fortifications date back to the 7th century BC. At its feet, the city of Corinth, one of the greatest cities of ancient Greece. Its Temple of Apollo was one of the first Doric temples in continental Greece. Pieces of pottery left behind by the builders indicate that the temple dates back to 540 BC. It was built on the site of an ancient temple. It had six monolithic columns covered in white marble stucco on each facade, and 15 columns along its length. Today, seven of these remain. They are over seven meters high with a base diameter of one meter 70. According to the ancient texts, there was a great bronze statue of Apollo in the temple. Corinth was a major merchant city. It controlled the Isthmus of Corinth. It rivaled with Athens on an economic and cultural level. During the Peloponnesian War, it allied itself with Sparta against the Athenians. 
In the second century BC, the site was pillaged by the Romans who annexed all of Greece. The Pyrene Fountain dates back to the 6th century BC. The original Greek part includes six stone arches and a series of underground reservoirs. The colonnade and the basin were added by the Roman Herodes Atticus in the 2nd century BC. Corinth was made up of three areas, the Acropolis on the hill, the city itself on a lower plateau, and the port, which was linked to the city by Lycaon Road. The wide road was made of limestone and flanked on either side by shops and temples built on raised walkways. The road led to the Agora, the main square of the ancient city. Sixty-five kilometers south of Corinth, in a mountainous region, the ancient city of Epidaurus contained the sanctuary of Asclepius, the most famous site of Greek medicine. This site sheltered the best-known doctors, and here, as in all Greek sanctuaries, athletic and theatrical events were organized in honor of the gods. Remains of athletic equipment were found at Epidaurus, but the site is especially famous for its theater. The theater was built on a hill slope around 330 BC. Of all the ancient theaters, the theater of Epidaurus is the best preserved. Nearly all of the gray limestones are the actual originals. Only those on the wings have been restored. The stands are arranged in a hemicycle, with 55 rows separated into two levels by a corridor. Originally, the theater was made up of 34 rows of stands separated by 13 staircases. It seated up to 6,200 spectators. The upper level, added in the second century BC, numbers 21 rows, augmenting the theater's capacity to 12,000 spectators. The circular orchestra, which held the actors, the choir, the dancers and musicians, lies in front of the quadrangular stage, whose substructure can still be seen. The theater of Epidaurus is especially famous for its acoustics. The slightest sound produced at the foot of the seats resounds all the way to the upper seats, located 22.5 meters above the orchestra. Since 1955, the annual Festival of Epidaurus takes place in this theater, performing the Greek tragedies of the ancient dramatists. Between Noplio and Corinth, Tiryns is an ancient Mycenaean city. In the upper part of the hill, called the Citadel, stands a Mycenaean palace dating back to 2000 BC. There are also remains of a cyclopean surrounding wall. The stones of the wall are up to three meters long and one meter wide. A path running under a tumulus leads to a tomb. This royal tomb in a shape of a beehive also reveals true skill in the art of construction. Not far from here, another site from the same civilization contains a big number of remains. It is the site of Mycenae, which gives its name to Mycenaean civilization. First of all, the grave circle. Numerous royal sepulchers were found within the two stone circles. Some of these are pit graves topped with a stone slab or a steel. The funerary materials found here, bones, arrowheads, daggers, masks, and jewels, indicate that the war chiefs and their families were buried here. 
the material and iconography of the graves revealed that Mycenae was governed by a rich warrior aristocracy whose representatives were of superior size and physical strength. The city was governed by a monarch called Wanaka. We do not know much about the civilization which emerged around 1700 BC. It came from the north during the Bronze Age and invaded all of Greece. Nevertheless, they are at the origins of Greek civilization, and Homer related the epic story of their king, Agamemnon, in the Trojan War. The disappearance of this civilization cannot be explained with precision. The causes of this are probably both external with earthquakes that might have displaced bodies of water and outside raids of new populations, and internal with an overly centralized and overly rigid administration, incapable of surmounting new crises. Just like in Tiryns, the city is enclosed by a cyclopean surrounding wall with two points of access. The Lion Gate and the Trillith makes up the main entrance. It has an enormous lintel topped with a relieving triangle slab on which two lionesses are carved, standing on either sides of the central pillar. The complex dates back to 1250 BC. The royal palace, accessed by a very steep path, is located at the highest point of the citadel. There are few remains, but it seems to have been composed of three rooms, two vestibules and a ceremonial room that contained a circular central fireplace and a throne. The palace overlooked other buildings of smaller size, as well as modest houses and the district of artisans. The Mycenaean period was a time of great prosperity in the Peloponnese. Its fleet controlled the seas and traded with Sicily, Crete, Syria, and Egypt. But there are so few traces of this civilization that the origins of such wealth can only be a matter of speculation. Conversely, some hypothesize that there were lootings or that mercenaries who left to combat the pharaohs and Hittites returned. A bit further away among the ruins, the best preserved and the most spectacular tomb is undoubtedly that of King Agamemnon's. It is also named the Treasury of Atreus. The Tholos was accessed by an inclined and uncovered entrance, or dromos, made of dry stone walls and spanning a length of 36 kilometers. Like the other royal tombs, the treasury of Atreus is made up of a subterranean circular room with a corbel arch covering that is ogival in section. Thirteen point five meters high and fourteen point five meters wide, it was the biggest dome in the world for over a thousand years. The inside was decorated in gold, silver, and bronze. The ruins of Mycenae truly nourish our imagination due to the few things we know about this civilization of archaic Greece. Located in the western Peloponnese, Olympia was a religious center located in a sacred grove of wild olive trees. The site seems to have been occupied continuously from the early 3rd millennia BC. Olympia was not a city, it was a sanctuary dedicated to Zeus. It was inhabited exclusively by the staff of the temples and the priests. A few beautiful remains subsist, like the Philippion, which was erected on order of Philip II of Macedonia, father of Alexander the Great, in 338 BC. This round building with its ionic columns contained the statues of the family and commemorated a military victory. There are also the remains of the thermal baths, which have not retained much from the Hellenistic period, for they were constantly and continuously extended, modified, and decorated.
but the main basin has preserved its beautiful mosaics. The Horean, devoted to Hera, the wife of Zeus, was probably the first known Doric edifice in the Peloponnese. It dates back to about 600 BC. Originally, its columns were all made of oak. They were progressively replaced by stone columns. The temple was 50 meters long, decked with 16 columns on each side. Impressive vestiges of its substructure remain. Inside stood a number of statues around the effigies of Hera and Zeus. They have disappeared, either pillaged or stalked in museums. There remain pedestals of honorific statues giving thanks to citizens for services rendered to the state. It is here in this temple that the torch of the Olympic Games was lit, and here the trophies were given to the winners of the events. For Olympia is directly and concretely associated with a world event, the Olympic Games. They were celebrated regularly here since the year 776 BC. The stadium was created in the classical period, while the monumental entrance with its corridor and arch dates back to the end of the Hellenistic period. The starting line can still be seen in the form of a line of stones in the ground as well as the foundations of the judges' platform. Until the finish line, the distance was 192.27 meters, with a width of 28.5 meters. There were never any seats for the 45,000 spectators who gathered here to watch the events. Like the athletes, they came from everywhere throughout the known world, from Marseille to Crimea and Africa to Asia. The Olympiads took place here with an interval of four years between each meeting. The spirit of the Olympic Games displays the strength of the humanistic ideals of ancient Greece. A loyal competition between free men, ready to surpass themselves, whose sole ambition was to attain the symbolic reward of an olive branch. No relation to the bloody games of the Roman circus. While the Olympiads were part of a sacred rite in a sacred sanctuary, the holiest of the holy was the Temple of Zeus, of course. It was built around 450 BC and suffered many catastrophes, notably a fire and an earthquake, which destroyed it. Like the entire site, it was found buried under a layer of alluvium many meters thick. It was a colossal 64-meter-long Doric temple which contained one of the seven ancient wonders of the world, a gold and ivory statue of Zeus, reaching 12.75 meters high. To the west of the Temple of Zeus are the remains of a building that has been identified as the workshop used by Phidias to create the gold and ivory statue of Zeus. Its dimensions, 32 meters by 14 and a half meters, are exactly those of the temple, where the worshipped statue was to be displayed. In the 5th century, a Byzantine church was built on its ruins. Its symbols and decorations can be seen here and there. The palestra was a small training gym. There, athletes trained in sports which do not require much room, like wrestling and jumping. Around the central space, the porticos were organized in small rooms where the athletes rubbed themselves with olive oil or, on the contrary, covered themselves in powder and ash.
All the vestiges of Olympia are now contained in the archaeological museum which houses the famous pediments of the Temple of Zeus. Mythological scenes sculpted in the marble are displayed on the two pediments. The greatest statues in the center rise 3.15 meters. The scenes represented in the temple illustrate the origins of Olympia and the sanctuary. The west pediment represents Centauromachi, the Battle of the Lapiths, a legendary people of northern Greece against the centaurs. This represents the victory of civilization over barbarism. In the center, Apollo tries to calm the warring parties, even though he has clearly chosen sides. The east pediment has 21 sculptures representing the preparations of the chariot races, one of the founding myths of the ancient Olympic Games. In the center, Zeus separates the two competitors who are accompanied by their wives and servants. No trace of the bronze chariots nor of the characters' weapons has been found. A special room within the museum is devoted to the Nike of Paeonios. Nearly three meters tall, it was placed on a nine meter high pedestal to the southeast of the Temple of Zeus. It is the first known representation of a winged Nike. Though she no longer has wings and a floating cape, her movement is still visible. She is descending from Olympus and is setting foot aground. Another room contains very rare examples of monumental statues made of terracotta, including one of Zeus kidnapping Ganymede. A beautiful head of Athena is also on display. She has almond-shaped eyes and wears a helmet. A few statues come from the Roman occupation, like that of Agrippina the Younger, the mother of Emperor Nero. A statue of the Roman Emperor Hadrian dates back to 160 AD. The she-wolf suckling Romulus and Remus is depicted on his breastplate. In the middle of a room, a marble bull bears an inscription indicating that the statue is devoted to Zeus. You can see, with its rich past, that Greece is truly the cradle of Western civilization. During the first millennium BC, it planted the seeds of a culture that is still in force today. The first Republican history Athenian democracy knew a great intellectual life, bringing together philosophers and playwrights. The Greeks are also considered the inventors of logic and the precursors to physics, mathematics, and astronomy. Furthermore, Greek art is still considered a model of balance and proportion for artists around the world. Throughout history, ancient Greece strongly influenced the culture of modern Western civilization.